The Tale of the American German Volunteers, or SS Renegades. This intriguing segment of our past remains shrouded in relative obscurity, a forgotten narrative waiting to be unravelled. So, today, we embark on a journey to unearth the concealed details of this historical anomaly, a facet of World War II that, for some inexplicable reason, has eluded comprehensive study. Did a significant number of American volunteers participate in this clandestine endeavour of joining the German war machine? more than we could have originally imagined. While Mark Felton recently shed light on this subject, our exploration takes us deeper into the shadows, revealing untold stories and shedding light on the motivations and forgotten documents proving that there is more than we originally knew, and that led some Americans to don German uniforms and see combat on the every front. In the years leading up to the outbreak of World War II, individuals of German descent residing outside Germany were actively encouraged to establish citizens' groups aimed at promoting German virtues globally. The primary objective was to advance causes aligned with the goals of the Nazi Party. In the United States, the America Deutsche Volksbund, also known as the German American Bund, emerged in 1936, presenting itself as an organization of patriotic Americans of German stock. The Bund operated approximately 20 youth and training camps and expanded its influence to include tens of thousands of members distributed among 70 regional divisions throughout the country. A significant event in the history of the German-American Bund occurred on February 20th, 1939, when the organization organized an Americanization rally at Madison Square Garden in New York. During this event, the Bund vehemently denounced Jewish conspiracies, President Roosevelt and other perceived adversaries. Attended by 20,000 supporters and members, the rally faced vehement opposition from large crowds of anti-fascists. The anti-fascist demonstrators were kept in check by a considerable presence of 1,500 New York City police officers. However, soon with the onset of World War II in 1939, the German-American Bund experienced a rapid decline. The organization disintegrated and many of its assets were seized. Furthermore, its leader was arrested on charges of embezzlement and subsequently deported to Germany. This marked the end of the German-American Bund's influence and activities in the United States as the nation became deeply engaged in the war effort against Germany and its allies. During the wartime era, German propaganda alleging that a significant number of Americans had defected from their military ranks to enlist with the German SS. This unsubstantiated claim sought to sow seeds of doubt and fear, portraying a distorted image of loyalty within the American armed forces. Adding to this, there arose a new division entity known as the George Washington Legion, an American legion purportedly fighting alongside Nazi Germany during World War II. This fanciful narrative aimed to exploit the fears of the American public, implying that some of their fellow countrymen had betrayed their allegiance and taken up arms against their nation. Before we go into the American men we found that joined that aren't known, we will quickly go over the official government records. A noteworthy but relatively small occurrence in 1940 involved a handful of Americans aligning themselves with the Germans during World War II. Surprisingly, the documented number of individuals involved stands at a mere five, suggesting the limited scale of this peculiar collaboration. Strikingly, Details about the fate and activities of these individuals have largely remained elusive since 1940, leaving a veil of mystery over their subsequent actions. Among those who chose to join forces with the Germans, a discernible pattern emerges in their backgrounds. The majority of them were individuals of German ethnicity who had settled in America, reflecting a possible connection to their ancestral homeland. Additionally, some of these Americans exhibited a tangible link to Germany, either through familial ties or a profound affinity for the culture and traditions of the fatherland. Here we have one example of an American born with French heritage, this isn't very well known, but many of these occurrences took place. His name born name is Peter Delaney, but went by Comte Pierre Louis de la Ney du Ver and was born in Holcomb, Missouri, USA in 1907. Peter lost his father at the age of seven, but his uncle financed his education at a military high school in Bell Buckle, Tennessee, USA. During this period, influenced by his French aunt, he embraced his French heritage. 
the Delaney family had emigrated to North America in the early 18th century, learned French and adopted the name Pierre. Following high school, while working at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Delaney converted to Catholicism, transitioning from his Lutheran upbringing. Subsequently, he received a scholarship to study in Rome, returning to St. Louis in 1932 as a professor of theology at Fontbonne College. While in Rome, Delaney applied for and was granted French citizenship through the French Embassy. In 1935, he was conscripted into the French Army, now going by the grandiose name Pierre de Lannay du Ver and claiming lineage from the Counts of Ver, he served with enthusiasm, obtaining a reserve commission and serving in the 152nd Infantry Regiment at Colmar, Alsace. In May 1940, he and his family lived in Lausanne, Switzerland, where Duvert supposedly operated as a French military intelligence agent. After the German invasion, they relocated to occupied France. Duvert's political stance leaned towards monarchism, French nationalism and reactionary views. He supported the anti-Semitic Charles Maurras, leader of Action Francaise, and harboured strong anglophobic sentiments aligning with the Vichy regime's ideology. He resigned from the French army in 1941, joined Pétain's Légion Française des Combattants, and later transferred to the Légion des Volontaires Français, the French legion within the German army. He participated in actions on the Eastern Front before serving with the collaborationist Vichy Militia, the Milice Française. Duvert then joined the Kurt Eggers Regiment, working as a radio propagandist. As early as 1941, Pierre had written a letter that stated, Ancy, France, March 3rd, 1941. Note that America has not yet been attacked by anyone, but America is clearly talking about extending the scope of the war, necessarily putting Japan into it and making it an ideological war. America has only its own interests in mind. With whom will they go to bed in their search of supremacy? With communism. God forbid, American material assistance to Stalin could cause the destruction of Europe and its Christian civilization. In Berlin 1945, the sophisticated and highly educated Duvert mentored the less experienced friend called Monty. Duvert arranged for Monty to document Soviet atrocities in Hungary and compile reports for broadcast to American audiences. Monty officially joined the Waffen-SS in early April 1945, coinciding with the disintegration of the Kurt Eggers Regiment in the face of the Soviet advance. A few days later, while the Allies were closing in on Berlin, the air raids became beyond brutal. An American-born Peter was killed by American bombers. That is only one story of Americans born fighting for the Germans. Obviously, there are much known cases of such as Monty, a second lieutenant in the US Army Air Corps, was stationed in Karachi on the Indian subcontinent in 1944. Displaying an unusual sense of logic, he went AWOL and journeyed to Cairo, Egypt, eventually reaching Italy. There, he commandeered a reconnaissance P-38 and flew to Milan, where he surrendered to the Germans, adopting the alias Martin Wiethaupt while assisting the Waffen-SS in propaganda efforts aimed at American POWs and Allied soldiers in Italy. Although Monty avoided direct combat as the war neared its end, he abandoned the SS, surrendered to the Americans in the South, and donned his SS officer uniform. He claimed it had been given to him by partisans to facilitate his escape to the American lines, concealing the fact that he had escaped with a P-38. The Americans, aware of his P-38 escapade, accepted his story of a lone heroic act against the Germans. Monty faced a court-martial for desertion and received a 15-year sentence of hard labour. Following a plea and appeal, President Truman pardoned him but mandated his re-enlistment as a precondition. The narrative takes an unusual turn when Monty re-enlisted in the army in 1946, eventually attaining the rank of sergeant. However, in 1948, his past as Martin Wiethaupt caught up with him, leading to his arrest by the FBI. Subsequently, he faced trial, resulting in a 25-year prison sentence. He was eventually granted parole in 1960 and passed away in the year 2000. Similarly, Mildred Gillards, a woman known for broadcasting messages to American soldiers in a captivating voice, found herself in legal trouble post-war. Following her trial, she received a sentence of 10 to 30 years of imprisonment, ultimately being paroled in 1961. She breathed her last in 1988. However, 
Our exploration doesn't conclude there. Following extensive research efforts, I stumbled upon an antiquated publication titled Unknown Foreign Volunteers of the Waffen-SS Soldiers from the Darkest Corners of Himmler's Military Empire by Cambridge River, distributed by Charles Martel Combs. Unfortunately, the author fails to provide any references for the information presented. Nevertheless, the content appears to be accurate and everything concerning Monty and Peter aligns with the verifiable truth. Within the pages of this book, numerous American names names emerge, recounting their participation in the Waffen-SS, including Stuka pilots. Let me share some intriguing details from the text with you guys. The first identification exactly as it states, Howard Margraf, born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 16 Oct 1916, joined our aid, Reichsarbeitsdienst, in 1938, joined the SS Freischer, joined the SS Heimwehr Danzig Battalion has two brothers named Eugene and Norman who also enlisted in the SS assigned to the SSTK division after when it absorbed the Heimwehr Danzig, released from Waffen SS in February 1941 and became involved in propaganda broadcasting escape, defected, to Switzerland in 1943 with his two brothers. Again, exactly as it states, Edwin Peter, born in New York, 12th of March 1918, reached the rank of Oberschauffeurer in Waffen-SS, no unit was mentioned, KIA on 2nd July 1941 in Latvia. Again, Georg MacDonald, born in Buffalo, 7th May 1922, reached the rank of Untersturmführer in Waffen-SS, no unit was mentioned. KIA on 14th of March 1944, Jovi Estonian Nick Clausen, born in Philadelphia on 23rd October 1924. American citizen residing in Denmark, possibly served either in Freikorps Denmark, Wiking or Nordland divisions. Senius Christian Olsen, born in Maison City on 3rd and January 1918. American citizen residing in Denmark, possibly served either in Freikorps Denmark, Wiking or Nordland divisions. Again, Richard Wesley Peterson, born in Minneapolis on 4th April 1925. American citizen residing in Denmark, possibly served either in Freikorps Denmark, Wiking or Nordland divisions. Elmer Johannes Nielsen, born in Omaha, Nebraska, 15th of June 1911. American citizen residing in Denmark, possibly served either in Freikorps, Denmark, Wiking or Nordland divisions. Even Tuxen Bjerg Nielsen, born in Omaha, Nebraska, 26th June 1920. American citizen residing in Denmark, possibly served either in Freikorps, Denmark, Wiking or Nordland divisions. Charles Braschwitz, born in New Jersey, 17th August 1911, Wachtmeister in SS Polizei Division KEA on 7th May 1945, Leibach, Slovenia. Raymond George Rommelspacher, born in Chicago, 30th May 1926. SS Grenadier KIA during Allied landings in Normandy 1944. Andreas Hauser, born in Los Angeles, 30th August 1893, KIA on 18th January 1945, Welikai, Ukraine. Andy Beneshan was born in New York on 1st September 1918, SS Unterschafu on 16th April 1945, Bosnia. William Thomas Buter, born in Trenton, New Jersey, 1920, living in Belgium when the war broke out, volunteered into the Walloon Legion under Wehrmacht, transferred to Waffen-SS in 1943. And death isn't stated. An American-born Stuka pilot killed in North Africa, Richard Engelbrecht, Leutnant FF, born 30 Nov, 1921, Atlanta, GA, USA, killed 11 May 1941 at Benghazi, Benina, serving with five Staffel Sturzkampfgeschwader Wines. Many of the individuals listed are American citizens who happened to be in Europe when World War II erupted. This fact is entirely reasonable, considering the prevalent American presence in Europe during that time. Moreover, it is plausible that some Americans sympathised with National Socialist views before the war, leading them to consider aligning with the Germans. The significant question, however, revolves around the lack of exploration into this aspect of history and the apparent reluctance of the US government to act acknowledge it. Why hasn't this subject been thoroughly investigated and what impediments exist in recognising such a complex and nuanced historical context? These are crucial questions that warrant further examination and discussion. However, our exploration again doesn't end here. I've delved deeper and unearthed official documents that substantiate these claims. Allow me to present them to you. 
Here is a man called Hans Hartwig Bruning, again another American born. Born in 1912 in Boston, USA, his document it states he was killed on the Eastern Front at Malkalinism in 1942. He was an Unteroffizier serving with the 2nd Infantry Battalion. Here is a Texas Department of State Health Services. Texas birth certificate for American Gerhard William Hermann Bunsau. He was a lieutenant serving with Stabs Barter 1st Artillery Regiment 90 with German parents living in America. Born 23rd October 1915 in El Paso, Texas, USA. Killed 27 October 1941 at Skirmanoa, Russia. Theodor Julius Joachimson, Oberleutnant, posthumously promoted to Hauptmann, served with two Fernkampfgeschwader. Geschwader. He was born on February 4th, 1913 in St. Thomas, Virgin Islands, USA. He lost his life on August 29th, 1942 at Flugplatz Drontheim Vernus, Norway. His final resting place is in Trondheim, Norway, where he was buried on September 1st, 1942. Henry Adami, or Adami, Gefreiter, served with 4 Comp Stom Battalion 186. He was born on September 20th, 1923, in Appleton or Appletown, USA. He fell in close combat on July 15th, 1943, northeast of Basmaya. Franz Westle Gefreiter served with 2nd Corps Nachrichtenabteilung 45. He was born on July 8th, 1909 in Dallas, Texas, and unfortunately, he passed away on January 22nd, 1943 at HV Cherikawa Husi Feodavka. William Schultz Matroza served with Marine Board Flak Abteilung Sud. He was born on May 30th, 1924 in Newark, New Jersey, and lost his life on November 11th, 1942 in the Mediterranean. And here we find ourselves at a fascinating historical crossroads. The intricacies of this chapter remain relatively obscure, overshadowed by more extensively studied aspects of World War II. Consider the remarkable phenomenon, Germany, a nation at the heart of one of the most devastating conflicts in human history, had nearly a million foreign recruits hailing from various corners of the globe. A noteworthy example lies in the diversity of the German forces during this tumultuous period. A mosaic of individuals, each with their unique background and motivations, converging to join the German war effort. One might find it surprising that the United States, a nation boasting incredible ethnic diversity even in the early to mid 20th century contributed its citizens to this international mix within the German ranks. The reasons behind such involvement are multifaceted and intriguing. One must delve into the complex geopolitical landscape and the personal stories of those who, for various reasons, found themselves entangled in the conflicts of the time. Perhaps some were driven by ideological convictions, while others may have been motivated by a desire for adventure or even economic considerations. The backdrop of global upheaval and the unprecedented scale of the war created a unique confluence of circumstances that brought together individuals from disparate backgrounds. Exploring the experiences of Americans who fought and in some cases perished within the German ranks opens a window into the complexities of human agency during wartime. Their stories, often overshadowed by the broader narrative, reveal the nuance and individuality that characterize historical events. It challenges us to look beyond the conventional perspectives and recognize the intricate tapestry of motivations and choices that unfolded during this tumultuous period. Indeed, during that period, a significant number of young men perceived the looming threat of communism as it cast its shadow across Europe. Driven by a profound sense of duty and a perceived obligation to counter this ideological force, many felt compelled to take action. Regardless of one's contemporary opinion on their choices, it is essential to recognize that in their eyes they believed they were doing what they deemed right at that crucial moment in history. The historical context plays a pivotal role in understanding the motivations of these individuals. The spectre of communism, with its far-reaching implications and ideological clashes, fueled a sense of urgency among those who saw themselves as defenders of certain values or systems. Whether fueled by genuine ideological conviction, anti-communist sentiment, or a combination of factors, these individuals felt a calling to confront what they perceived as a formidable and imminent threat. It is vital to approach the actions of these young men with a nuanced understanding, acknowledging the complexity of historical circumstances. 
The lens of hindsight may lead us to pass judgment on their decisions, yet history seldom unfolds in simple black and white terms. The socio-political climate of the time, coupled with the uncertainties of a world grappling with profound changes, created an environment where individuals felt compelled to make choices that, from their perspective, were aligned with what they considered just and necessary. And there you have it folks, we sincerely hope you've gained valuable insights into this often overlooked piece of history. Don't forget to explore additional content and support us on Patreon and Instagram for exclusive updates. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, it truly goes a long way in helping us grow. It's been a pleasure sharing this historical journey with you, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Until then, goodbye for now.